You're watching Vancouver TV, where we show you what's happening in your city. We've got the latest movie reviews and access to your favorite celebs. From fashion to red carpets, live shows, and more, we cover it all, keeping you informed about your city and in the know about upcoming events. Last stop. Lewis? I'm your Uncle Jonathan. Are you wearing a robe? It's a kimono. Here we are. Home sweet home. You're Lewis, I presume. How was your trip? This old hag is my neighbor. I'm relieved to see you didn't inherit your uncle's freakishly oversized head. My god, did that withered purple skeleton just speak? You'll see, it's quite different here. Have a look around. You're perfectly safe. As long as it's fed. Do you know what a warlock is, Lewis? A boy witch. I think they're a little more than boy witches. Are you saying that you're a warlock? Please teach me, please, please. Okay, have it your way. I can give you the right books, teach you the right spells, but that last 1%, that's up to you. I don't want the creepy little runt. Think I want him? Lucky shot. You've told Lewis everything? Well, not everything. Do you hear the ticking? Ticking, ticking? This house used to be owned by another warlock. He's very wicked. Very powerful. He left a hidden clock in the walls. We don't know what it does except something horrible. Three gongs. Last time it was four. What happens when it gets down to one? Nothing good, that's for certain. We have to destroy the clock. So creepy. You can't do this alone. I can help you. You want to see some real magic? I'll show you. God, I hate pumpkins. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> to win tickets to see this movie and other fun movie price packs, visit www.vancouvertelevision.ca. Hi, I'm Ashley Davidson with Vancouver Television. Today we are here at the Directors Guild of Canada, British Columbia where we'll be interviewing some of Vancouver's top directors on their films, which will be screening in the Directors Showcase Weekend. It will be September 7th, 8th, and 9th, held at the Van City Theatre. Let's go talk to the directors and see the magic behind the lens. Okay, so we're just with Charles Wilkinson. You directed Hi to Gwai on the Edge of the World. Yep. And why don't you start off by telling us a bit about that experience? Well, the the tagline on the poster is maybe we're not totally screwed, mm -hmm. which should give you some idea that it's a fairly unusual environmental film. So many environmental films are pretty scary and pretty depressing, and this one isn't. It's actually mm -hmm. quite hopeful. It's also extremely beautiful and uplifting, and, and it's just a uh, it's a good experience to watch. Yeah. So how did you, why hi to Gwai? Well, because, I mean, that's a really complex question. We could be mm -hmm. here all day, but, <laughs> but, but, but um, hi to Gwai is an archipelago. And because it's cut off from the mainland by, you know, 80 miles of water, 80 kilometers of water, um, it's harder for influences to affect it immediately. So the people who live, who've lived there for 14, 15,000 years and counting have been able to maintain a continuous society all that time. Mm -hmm. And even today, it's hard to get there. It's expensive to get there, so people, tend to to clump up and to 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 create this island mentality mm -hmm. and so uh, it's not like here on the mainland there all these influences wash over us all the time there it's much harder for that so when people get an idea for example how about if we stop the international forest companies from cutting down all our trees when they get an idea like that it's actually possible to implement action that will stop it and which is what they did and there's no shopping malls 
No, not even None a single one. Well, they have something they call a mall in, in, in uh, uh, Queen Charlotte. What does that so look like? It's hilarious. It's about as big as this room, actually. <laughs> There's a dollar store and, and a coffee shop. That's about it. That's pretty cool, though, how it just shows that we don't actually need that much. No. Nope. Like, we can live very simply, but we make uh, it so complex. Well, <laughs> you see, that's another thing that's really cool about the society on, on Haida Kwai is that up until very recently, there really was very poor cell phone service. It still isn't great. Mm -hmm. So people didn't have smartphones. They didn't walk around. They weren't on it's Instagram? Like, no, no, no. Not, not, they weren't. <laughs> Every hour. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and because there's no malls, there's no franchises at all there, you won't see any logos. Um, people have time to spend with each other, they talk to each other. When you make an appointment to hang out with somebody mm -hmm. on Adequa, they're usually an hour late because they're hanging out with somebody else that they happen to meet on the way. So it's that kind of a society. And, and so people uh, source their own food, they trade food, they give it away. Um, you can't walk on Adequa because people stop and pick you up. It, it, what do you mean, how do they pick you up? Well, you'd, if you're walking down the road, people just pull over and say, hey, where are you going? Oh, let me drive you. And oh, like yeah, here, it would be creepy. Oh, it would be super creepy. <laughs> and it's not there at all, yeah. But, but I mean, the story of Haida Gwaii is, is that this is a people, both the First Nations people whose traditional lands that, that Haida Gwaii is, and also the settler community, people, like-minded people who've come there, have banded together to create a society where the values are not purely economic where people are there for reasons other than that you can make a phenomenal living. And what they did is they saw, um, you know, some decades ago, they saw that the forest companies were completely stripping the land bare and they banded together and in a monumental effort. And they stopped the logging on Lyle Island and the South Moresby, and they, which is half of the archipelago, and they forced the, the federal and the provincial government into declaring it a park. And the interesting thing about the park is that it is co-owned and cooperated by the Haida Nation and by the federal government and they have a 50-50, not 51-49, a 50-50 power sharing agreement. So if the Haida don't agree with the um, parks putting in some tulip beds somewhere, it doesn't happen. Oh wow. Yeah, it's really They just band together. And they do. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, so and it's a unique agreement and it works really, really well. So it's just the story, the story of the film is the story of Haida Gwaii, which is a, it's a place where things are possible that you wouldn't think are possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even before hearing about this, because I went and watched the trailer, I was like, this is like a little dream world. Yeah, it kind of, I mean, we just, I don't want to idealize it. Still bad things happen there, you know? Yeah. And logging is still, you know, in many parts, in some parts, kind of out of control. There's still controversy, there's overfishing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but at least they're discussed on a daily basis. We don't even talk about it. But mm -hmm. there, people, everybody's on a committee, everybody goes to the meetings, you know, it's... it's so no one, not everyone can just get up and go there. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. so you're like, you know what, I really love Haida yeah. Gwaii. I want yeah. to live there now. What well, is, <laughs> can well, anyone just go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. Oh. Yeah, sure. But I mean, the infrastructure there is quite challenged. Uh, housing is always in relatively short supply. Mm. And uh, there's been a freeze on uh, Crown Land uh, alienation, I guess it's called. Like, you can't just go and alienate a block of Crown Land and say, we're going to build a, an apartment tower here, mm. pending the settling of the land claims issue, which is moving along. So, but people do go there. But, you know, just to keep it in perspective, it's hard to make a living there. Mm. You know, there aren't, aren't jobs like where you make $100,000 a year. There, there are very few jobs like that. They like trade goods? Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, young people really tend to like living there, but people seem to go there for a time. Mm. And then, and even the Haida move on and off all the time. The population kind of rotates. That's really cool. Yeah, How but, many people are there? Well, it varies between 5,000, 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, the summertime, obviously, the population spikes like crazy because it's, uh, although, I mean, realistically, the weather can be anything, anytime. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you were saying that you were surprised at how many people were into this? Um, Lining up around the block? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it, the yeah. film was amazingly yeah. popular. Uh, uh, we, at first, we didn't get it. Like, you know, we started playing it. Well, we went to the festivals and it won top award at, at Hot Talks, and which was, you know, stunning. Uh, when they announced, I thought, is there another kind of guy film here? <laughs> and and then uh, and then you know the Rio and, and Van City Theater and the Blur in Toronto. You know, people lined up around the block. You know, 30 times, 40 times was the highest grossing Canadian film per screen. Not just Canadian documentary, but Canadian drama per screen for all of fall and, and winter of 2016. So. You know, we were stunned, but what we realized, I mean, I sat and for every q and I went to all of them here and many of them in Toronto, and what people said over and over again is that it was, it's a positive story, it's, a, it's actually a really a feel-good story. I mean, people cheer in the film. There's some wonderful, wonderful happy moments, and also some serious discussion, but people really said, 
it's great to see a, a film of the environment that doesn't leave you feeling suicidal. Yeah, <laughs> right. I know that. I know on the news nowadays, it's like I can't even watch it because no, <laughs> it's like earthquake, yeah. fire, am I gonna yeah. die? Like, yeah. you know, and it's scary. It's really scary, justifiably so. But things yeah. can be done, and I guess yeah. that's that's really what the main message of the film is: is mm -hmm. that you know, it's not like broccoli. It's not something like oh, you have to do, but it's boring. These people have great life. Like it's yeah. way more fun to be able to you know, go for a long walk in the woods and go fishing and stuff than it is to sit in a cubicle making the money that you'd use yeah. to go to the gym and, and buy, you know, a fish burger. They're actually animals. living. Yeah. 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 Kind of the way that our parents and grandparents did. Yeah. Um, and that's that's wonderful. And that influence, you know, uh, Severin Suzuki is in the picture, David's daughter, and she's wonderful. And she says says something to the effect that you don't have to go to Haida Gwaii to live like this. Mm. Everywhere you go, there's nature. Yeah. And you look under the sidewalk, there's mm -hmm. grass, you know. Um, we can live this way wherever we are. Just get involved in, in sourcing your own food and get involved in community. Yeah, how do you do something like that? Well, here actually, it's, yeah. it's be, you know since we made the film, it's become more. And more I'm not that the film has anything to do with it, but it's become. I'm sure it does. Oh, it's all. Up to <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> the, 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 you see how people go. Like our son's an organic uh, farmer out in, in uh, Abbotsford, and we go to the market often, oh, and yeah. we see people. I mean, the, the markets are becoming more and more popular. People go Saturday and, morning, and they know market. the person who's growing their vegetables. Mm. They know the person who's producing their eggs, and also people get involved more and more in community. And that's what the key to Haida Gwaii is. And that's what the key to the film is is that when people band together in an unmediated interaction, that is to say, not mediated by Netflix or by you know famous players, but like where they can actually just sit and talk to each other, mm -hmm. then truly revolutionary things happen. Yeah, and it's kind of getting back to like our roots too, yep. because that is, it used to be normal. That's used you to know? be how we did stuff. And it's yeah. so much healthier too to eat local, yeah. and it tastes so different when you actually oh take a carrot out of a garden <laughs> versus like, you know what I mean? Oh, if you garden. buy it from the store, oh, yeah, no, you're like, wow, this actually yeah. tastes Good. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, on Haida Gwaii, I think there's maybe three or four really terrific restaurants. They're hard to find, but you can fi find them. But otherwise, I mean, you know, just like with the hotels, there's really not much infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we, when we go there, we eat better than we eat anywhere else in the world because the food that comes out of the water there, comes off the beach and so forth, is unbelievably fresh. And people are amazing cooks. And, and also, because there's no restaurants, people have dinner parties all the time. Oh, that's so cool. And they invite you and it's just like, oh my God, how did you cook this? It's just so, yeah. right? And it's also the community and, yeah. and that kind of thing, yeah. you know, just like connection, yeah. which I feel yeah. like a lot of people are lacking. Yeah. Nowadays, like being yeah. on their phone, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that human. Yeah, and and, and I must say, you know, bringing it back to a film a filmmaking uh, perspective, it's hard and challenging to find stories like the Haida Gwaii story mm -hmm. that do show some signs of hope and promise. And yet, it's very clear to me that that's what audiences are really hungering for. Is something like clearly our leaders, for the most part, aren't going to show the way, mm -hmm. and so we have to take control of our lives ourselves. This is a group of people who largely have, and it's inspiring, and it kind of points the way. To find stories like that to make films about is like, yeah. That's amazing. And people can just look up Haida Gwaii on the edge of the world yep. online. Yep. Um, yeah, just uh, actually go to HaidaGwaiiFilm.com or go to mm -hmm. my website, CharlesWilkinson.com, or actually just type in Haida Gwaii and our film will come up because there's so many hits. And um, you can buy DVDs or Blu-rays, do. <laughs> or there's other ways of seeing it. There's screenings all the time and stuff like that. Awesome. So we're just here with Alan Harmon. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Ashley. How are you? Good. So you are the chairman of the Directors Guild? Yes, of uh, British Columbia for the province, mm -hmm. the district council, yeah. Awesome. So you are going to tell us a little bit about, you have a, the, an event coming up. Yeah, this is the premiere event of what we call the Directors Showcase Weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we are the union that represents directors and also assistant directors and production managers and location teams and production assistants. Uh, we have uh, what we think in our director's caucus is a, is, is a gathering of a, of a pretty unique and a pretty uh, impressive group of, of film directors, film and television directors. Uh, and it occurred to me uh, in talking to some of the members of the board, uh, the executive board for the Directors Guild, that um, there are some really good uh, protein, really kind of yeasty exciting film festivals in the world and having you know later in my career now I had suddenly the time to be able to go to some of these festivals and enjoy them uh, I got the idea that 
we've got enough talent within this specific district council in this province to be able to sustain, you know, an ongoing yearly event for uh, for the public for uh, the exposure of the work of uh, some of our members. Right, we've got some members, and this is going back to the beginnings of um, you know cinematography, filmmaking, documentary style making, and movies and television. Um, this is going back to you know a considerably long period ago. You know, we've got directors like Daryl Duke and Jack Darkus and uh, Zale Dalen, all of whose work will probably not will not be in this first uh, premiere weekend, but we anticipate going again uh, in the future. Uh, with this, we'd like to make it yearly, and 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 the works of those members that I just mentioned. Uh, are certainly going to be uh, highlighted over the years. Yeah. So we're just here with Vic Saren. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And you're your director. Correct. And your recent project was Keepers of Magic. I direct, but I also photograph my films. Mm. So I do both. And that's why the Keepers of the Magic is about the cinematographers. Right. So it came because of my own, you know, journey in that area, mm -hmm. uh, photographing all the films. So you get to know who's doing what. That and really so cool. over the years, I have seen some amazing images, as we all have over the years. Films like Godfather, Apocalypse Now, English Patient. But you know, we always, those images, we are turned to those images, and we know about the actors. Mm -hmm. We know about the directors. But nobody knows about who's the man behind the lens who has photographed those things. So I thought it would be wonderful to do a film about some of these iconic cinematographers who gave us these amazing images which haunt you long after the lights are on. So this story is about those people and how those images were created. That is so beautiful. I hope you get, you get to watch it. <laughs> I want to now. That is, I love that concept because you're right. It's not yeah, yeah. just what people see. It's what you know, what goes on behind the lens. And without those people, it would now, never. Spe happen. Especially in the old film days when mm -hmm. we had no monitors. So after each take, the director will say cut, and he will turn to the camera guy. How was it? Mm. Because the cameraman is the first guy watching the film in those days. He's the only one who's watching it because his camera is right close up on your face, as opposed to the director who's watching everything. So the relationship of the director and cinematographer was so special those days. Now it's changed now. Now we have a monitor, everybody watches it, everybody has their say in it. So that I think I did, the reason I, I was very keen to celebrate these people because the film is gone now. Mm -hmm. These people are almost at the end of their life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, Gordon uh, Billis, who shot uh, Godfather, he did all also Woody Allen's films and all that. I did his last interview, then he passed away after that, and he's in the oh. film. Oh, that's so special. So I'm so happy that I was able to talk to him and have us with us for a long time to come now. Well, I really want to see this. <laughs> is this going to be at the director's event? <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, it is, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so now I have to go. <laughs> I think you love it because it's all about images. It's all mm -hmm. about magic. And magic to me is the camera. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, we you know, we, we, again, we talk about directors, we talk about actors, but in the old days particularly, cinema is about images. Directors and actors can't do a thing unless the camera is there. Yeah. So camera played a huge role in those days. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I want to celebrate the people who created those images for us. Mm -hmm. so this cool. film is about that. I love the title too, Keepers of Magic. <laughs> That's really nice. Thank you. Because to me, the film is magic still, it still is. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just here with Namisha. How are you? I'm really well. Good, so you're a writer, director, producer, I'm actor. a filmmaker, no. yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I you're like behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I cut it off there, yeah, definitely not an actor, but I'm a, yeah, I'm a writer, director, producer. And you just had a short film called In the Deep. 
Yes, In, a, in the Deep was a, a Crazy Eights film. Um, I made it in 2013 and I co-wrote it with Orsi Zabo and uh, we pitched it at Crazy Eights and we were selected and we got to make her film. That must have been super exciting. It was. Uh, you know, it has a, it had a really great life. It played up at Whistler and it's, um, it was uh, purchased, acquired by CBC and so it, uh, it was a really uh, special project to work on. I know for both me and Orsi, we felt very personally attached to the story. So did you write it as we, well? Yeah, I co-wrote it with Orsi mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, we were both, um, the film is about uh, a girl who is um, terminally ill, who's kind of returning home and sort of dealing, dealing with her estranged father and trying to reconnect. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Orsi and I had both lost people in our lives and mm -hmm. that kind of inspired the, the story. And I, yeah, we were just really happy to share, share the film. Awesome, so we're just here with Ann Wheeler. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, yeah. Good, your cheeks look nice and rosy. Well, that's because I pinched them like my mother told me to do it before I had my picture taken, so there you go. And you still do, and it, and it works. It works, just... it works for about, about 20 seconds, so I guess we'll have to be fast. <laughs> that's awesome. So you are a director? I am, yes, director, writer, Producer. Producer. All of it. Don't produce anymore, but yeah, yeah. still write and direct. And Bye Bye Blues was? Way back in 1989. So uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of inspired by my mother's story, mm. who uh, was during the war. Um, my father was missing at war, and uh, she ended up playing for a dance band. Mm. So it's the story of sort of how she survived the war and how she changed. and. Um, I think it speaks to a lot of women that lived through that era. It was sort of the first of its kind to speak to the home front and, and the challenges that the people back home faced being alone for mm -hmm. that period of time. She was actually, they were separated for five years. Oh, and she couldn't talk to... She didn't know no. if he was alive. He didn't, she didn't know Whoa. if he'd come home. So she just had to, she had three kids and, um, and she just uh, did what she had to do to survive. And of course that changes her. And of course, the men that came home were changed. So mm -hmm. at the end of the war, there was yet a, a bigger challenge because all of a sudden the person you were married to was not necessarily the person that you knew. Mm hmm. Yeah. Totally. And this is based on a real story. So you wrote this? I wrote this, yes. Yeah. It wow. was It's uh, it, very close to my mother's own story, but I, I interviewed a lot of women. I sort of approached it like a, a documentary, mm -hmm. which I had been a documentary filmmaker. And I talked to a lot of women. And I integrated some of those stories into this story. So I, I changed all the names and I, you know, adjusted it enough that that um, I, I kept the core. But I think it speaks to a broader, you know, broader audience than, mm -hmm. than just somebody who had an experience just like my mother's. Because during the Second World War, thousands and thousands of men came from all over the world to train in Canada to fly. Mm -hmm. And that's where she ended up was like playing in the bands that had that enormous new audience and um, so the, there was a lot of drama, there was a lot of romances between the airmen and the, the young Canadian women so that's also yeah. woven into there. I know, that was, I know, it's just all I was thinking because I haven't seen it but all I was thinking of is like what would, what would you do in that situation if your husband left and it's been five years and you don't know if they're coming back, like are you well, yeah, and she Singular. was like extremely beautiful and yeah. very talented and vivacious. I mean, like the actress that plays her, Rebecca Jenkins, loved yeah. music, uh, you know, just lit up when, when she sang and played and mm -hmm. um, met a whole group of, you know, she was a farmer's daughter, so mm -hmm. she met a whole group of new people and looked at life a whole different way. And um, she, uh, she really excelled, and, but when I was growing up, I didn't know that, right? I, mm. I didn't know what she had lived through. She was my mom, and she was the most beautiful mom on the block. Aww. And as she played, when anybody asked her, she would get, sit down and play the piano, and everybody would be aghast, because she was mm. like such a hot piano player, like a real, she'd all of a sudden, you know, become somebody else, mm. like a blues, and then she'd sing with a rough voice, and you know, this was my mother, the doctor's wife. So mm -hmm. I knew she'd had another life, and so it was very exciting for me to to uh, come to understand what she had lived. That is really neat. And how did we were actually just talking about this? Like how when so obviously you like when all of this comes into your mind, you're like, I want to write a movie. How did that process start? So you started by Well, I'd already, movie. I'd been in the business almost 20 years. Oh, wow. Old. Yeah. Oh, I wow. Did, I, my first 10 years in the business, I mostly did documentaries, and then mm -hmm. I started doing short dramas, 
And there really maybe there were three of us women in the country that were directing, starting to direct drama. So it was kind of unheard of. Mm -hmm. And I did um, short films and then one hours and I built up very slowly to doing features. I'd already done three features before I did this mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that I you know, really had my, my skills up. Because I kind of knew if I fell on my face, it would it would you know have implications for women that followed me. Because mm -hmm. I was really I knew I was the first to do a lot of things in the business. So so you know I, I was cautious. I didn't like nowadays it seems people make a student film and then they decide they're going to make a feature. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like that back there. You kind of you, you know work your way. Yeah. Own yeah. your skills first. <laughs> for sure. Like I shot movies. I edited films. I. Um, you know, I, I rolled cable, I shot several documentaries, I edited other people's films, I, you know, because I wanted to be an all-around filmmaker, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I just, I learned because for me, film, I got into film because that was political, mm -hmm. and, and film was a tool, and mm -hmm. it was a, a very, you know, strong tool to say something, I, you know, I had strong feelings about Western Canada, about mm -hmm. women's rights, about native rights, about the environment. And this seemed to be the best way to get it across, the message across. So I started with a co-op and none of us knew really how to make films. So we, we, if I directed one, the next time I'd take sound and the next time I might pull a cable, the next one I might write, the next one I might raise money. We did that for six years together and we made 40 films. So Whoa. it was sort of a, a you know, self-designed film school. Mm -hmm. And after that 60 years, uh, six years, <laughs> Uh, we sort of started going our own separate ways. We kind of knew what we were good at and uh, we knew what we wanted to say. And I was the only w woman in, the, in a group of nine. So my interests uh, were, were clearly different than most. And um, yeah, so we split off. We've all remained friends. And it was just the best way to start a career because if you pay for your mistakes, you never make them again. Mm. Thanks for watching Vancouver Television. I had so much fun today. I hope you enjoyed these conversations as much as I did and now you have just a little bit more of an idea of what goes on behind the lens. Until next time.